Hey guys, uh, let's get started. Let's get started with today's uh, lecture. You know, as I said already the last time, this week is going to be a, a little odd because we're catching up on stuff. So uh, I want to use this lecture today to um, catch up on some of the stuff that we had to cut short a little bit or where we didn't really have the time to, to get into, into detail. So I'm going to revisit two of the topics, one of the topics from, from last lecture on literature and another one from the one that we had before on research design. Yeah. Uh, while doing so, I'm going to attempt to put this into the big picture for you. Uh, I noticed that sometimes this can help. Uh, it doesn't change the thing that you need to know the content nevertheless, yeah, but sometimes it can help to organize a little bit where, we, where are we in the, in the big picture of the research process or within this lecture. Yeah? And in a similar context on Wednesday, but I'll come back to that in a second here, as I had already mentioned, we're going to have the big quiz. It's also going to be a review session, but it's going to be a test for you to see where you are uh, with the readings and with the lecture so far. Yeah? Okay, so, uh, but before we get to that, uh, just a reminder, it's this odd week again, and so it's seminar time. You know the drill, the assignment is on Blackboard. Uh, you have seminars uh, this week. Okay, and as I said, you know, on Wednesday we're going to have the big quiz. Uh, what is it? Well, actually it's going to be a bit of a, of a well, I'm going to see how it is, but you know, we did some, some questions before, but the largest chunk of the lecture is going to be in a similar fashion where you have an opportunity to see where you are uh, and I'm going to use that to review certain context and, and certain, certain things that we talked about before. Yeah? So if you don't already bring that anyway, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but uh, bring it on Wednesday for sure, a computer, tablet, phone, whatever. Yeah? So this really makes, um, makes your life easier. We're going to use it. Similar context, you know, a while back I had shown you this picture of this cow. So on Wednesday I'm going to debrief you on that. I'm going to tell you a little bit what the point of this was. Again, that's sort of part of doing research. Yeah, I do research and then I debrief my subjects. I tell them afterwards. Or I give them the opportunity to, to learn about what this research was all about. Okay, so it, again it nicely fits with what you are actually, what we're doing when we do research. Okay. So we have two things that we need to catch up on a little bit. Um, one part is some leftover from literature review and search. You know, in particular, I want to talk a little more about citations and plagiarism. I think it's important to talk about that uh, at some point at university and first year, it's the point to, to talk about that. And, uh, and then the second part, I'm going to jump into research designs again. Yeah, while we had like, I started to talk about experimental designs, I will talk about four other kinds of designs in that context. Yeah. But I'm also going to try to, to give you the big picture idea. Yeah. Okay, so let's get started with the literature. Yeah. And where do we fit within the research process? Yeah, that, that sort of can help to see where we are. You know, we had this one lecture where I showed you, I don't know, these different steps, and you know, this can be really boring, and I always feel completely always very patronizing, telling people about this is the process, how it goes, yeah? because surely there are other ways to do it, but nevertheless helps to organize your work and organize your, your, your project, or in particular how, uh, how, how, how this lecture here is organized as well. So when we talk about the research process, you know, we had these four different phases. Yeah, remember, there's nothing new now. Uh, we had like an exploration phase, then we had planning on execution, the reporting, and we started talking about several issues within this exploration complex already. Remember I had a whole lecture on finding a research question. Now that's actually very important. I think this is where all good research starts. If you don't have a good research question or if you don't really think about that, then you'll have trouble all the time. So when students approach me, I'm really giving them a hard time to find a research question. Uh, not to make them feel bad, but in order because that's what is required for the for the um, for good research to to have at the end of the day. So I remember, you know, when I did my PhD. Finally, this next weekend, not this weekend, this coming weekend, I'm going back to where I did my PhD for one of those alumni events. And uh, I remember that back in the days, you know, we had some dinners, and I was sitting there, and people asked me about, so what is your research question? What is your research all about? I just wanted to run up, run away, and cry, yeah, because you don't really know what the hell you're doing. And it's like this thorn that is kind of sticking into you, like, what is your research question? Yeah? It's horrible. 
uh, those guys probably just wanted to have a conversation. They just were interested in what I, what I was going to do. But um, really thinking about your research question, even when it's very hard and difficult, it's very, very important. Yeah? So that's sort of the starting point of this. OK, but then we also talked a little bit about you know, what is the theory. And I kind of used the example of cognitive dissonance reduction. And we talked about you know, how to make an explanation. You know, we talked an awful amount about causality uh, because this is important. It sort of fits in that complex. And then it, you actually then, then you would go on and then you would go out and do a literature search and literature review. And that's sort of what I started the last lecture. And this is basically where we are where we are right now. Yeah. So we're talking about uh, literature review and search. This is sort of once you kind of got your question, and once you thought about okay, what are the theories, or how can I explain stuff, or what are possible alternative explanation? Because at the end of the day, a theory is nothing else than an explanation for what you want to, uh, what you want to um, for your research question. Now, it's one possible explanation for your research question, and uh, but then you need to go and you need to do your homework. Yeah? So, what did other people study in this context so far? What did other people find? How do I connect with the, with the existing debates? So what do people really care about? What kind of methods did they use? What kind of data did they have? Yeah. So these kind of things. So you cannot, you cannot just do things out in the void. You need to connect to uh, the existing work. And that's sort of how we incrementally make progress in, uh, in, in the sciences yeah, or in the academic, academic business. That sort of differentiates us from being non-systematic. Yeah? We kind of make, we build on the shoulders of giants, we build on the shoulders of others, and then we kind of move incrementally one step forward. And sometimes these are really small, tiny steps that we make, but nevertheless, we move forward. Okay, so now we are within this complex of uh, I don't know, literature, and within that, you know, I started to talk about five different steps to go about doing a literature review and search and the things that you need to uh, consider in that context, and, uh, and, and this is basically where I'm going to start now. So I'm going to jump back into that, and I'm going to start talking about the last step, about writing things then up, your literature review after you've done the search, because this is sort of where we, where we, where we stopped the last time. And then in that context, I want to talk a little more about how do we cite things, you know, what is citation and so on, because essentially this is making those links, making those links to the existing literature or to previous, previous work. Yeah. So that's what I mean with the literature, like previous work in that, in that field. And in that context, let's talk quickly about plagiarism as well. Okay, so this is sort of like the big picture where we are, if you would zoom in a little bit. And uh, for the rest of the, you know, I have some more We'll come back to this research process things because the rest of the of the lecture is going to fit into that schema as well. Yeah? We're going to jump back into then operationalization, measurement, uh, different methods, sampling, analysis, and so on. It's all part of of this research process tree, so to speak. Okay, so you know we had these five different steps. So again, I feel like I'm. I'm incredibly patronizing telling you about these different things, but nevertheless, it's very useful. You know, like define your, your clear topic here, go and do your research. Well, actually, this is the assignment this week. You really have to go and do some research. You have to go into the library catalog and kind of find the relevant literature. And then you need to filter it somehow as well. Well, you need to sort of assess which ones of those 10,000 results that I get is actually relevant for me. Now, I talked about how you can how you can assess that in terms of looking at the outlet. Where was it published? You know, is it like, like a big journal? Is it like uh, something that is not known at all? Or another possibility is looking at how many other people refer to this particular work. You know, if a lot of people refer to this particular work, it's very likely that this is actually important. Right? While if nobody really cares about that piece of work, well, that doesn't mean that it's completely uh, useless then, but um, maybe you should be a little more cautious about that. Maybe there's something in it that is not that great. Then you need to analyze this somehow. You know, it's a bit like already like a, like a data analysis step, but it's actually within the literature. And you have the broad, the broad idea of all those different papers that you need to read and you need to, need to I don't know, uh, digest somehow. You know, and then you write up what we call the literature review. And that's basically where we are right now. Yeah? So at the end, you need to condense the, you go out and you find literature on a particular topic, and then you need to condense that 
in a digestible form, yeah, so that I, as a reader, then get an overview on what is out there. Yeah? What did other people do already? What are the relevant debates? And so on. And this is where we are. So, uh, so this is where we are. At the end, you need to write a literature review. And when you write a literature review, you know, you basically you summarize the existing research, yeah? and uh, you almost set it up like a mini essay. Yeah? That's basically what it is. It's like a mini essay in itself uh, that has, uh, or even you can even apply that logic. That's what I do when I sit down with my PhD students. Really apply that logic on a paragraph level. Yeah? It's not just for the literature, but we really zoom in. Yeah? Each paragraph, when you write a paragraph, you know, it has an introduction. There's a quick sentence at the beginning that kind of says what this paragraph is about. And what. Then there's sort of like the body in it, you know, which contains uh, your discussion on, on, of the sources, and you, know, and you can organize it in different ways, you know, chronologically, thematically, or methodologically. Um, chronologically means you basically just rewind what did people find on this particular topic over time. You know? What sort of, the, I don't know, when they first studied this, what did they next? Thematically, when you kind of realize there are certain themes emerging, and you say, okay, people looked at, I don't know, social health inequalities and social networks, for example, in that context, thematically, for example, in the context of obesity. Other people looked at it in the context of um, stress. Other people looked at it in the context of, uh, um, of mental health. Yeah. So that would be now a thematical grouping of, uh, of the existing literature on a particular topic like uh, social uh, health inequalities and social networks. And that would be now the broad topic and you, you zoom in and organize it thematically. Or you can organize your literature or summar summary of the findings methodologically. What does that mean? Well, it means like, what did people actually do? Yeah. Did they actually, you can say, okay, people did um, use large data sets to analyze social and health inequalities in a way. Pre-existing data sets, let's say the European Social Survey, a big data set. We're going to come back to it at some point later on. Or you say people um, went out and did interviews, they talked to people. Or people um, did an experiment. Or people did a survey. Yeah? This is sort of now a methodological grouping, yeah? how you would uh, then summarize the existing research or that you found within that body. And then at the end, you know, really it is like a mini paper, you know, and, and keep in mind it's even on the paragraph level, it's like that too. You then have a conclusion recommendation. Yeah? So what do, we, what do we take out of this? Yeah. Where do we stand? And when you write, uh, when you write exam questions, you know, it's not just for my course, but generally, you know, if you, if you follow this, I, don't know, I can bet you you're going to get better scores at the end of the day, even if you bring across the same contents, yeah. because it's really a, an easier way to digest things. Yeah. And that's sort of what you need to think about. If you're writing in such a way that I can't understand you, or if you could have put lots of typos in there, or put lots of grammatical errors, or these kind of things, then I don't, then I get tired reading this. Yeah. And that's not just me, but that's, that's, you need to think of your general audience, whoever that is. Yeah. I need to think of, other academics that read my books, my research papers, and so on. Or even you, when you read my writings. Yeah. Uh, when you write a report, you need to think about people in your company yeah, that kind of are going to read that report. It needs to be clear. It needs to be digestible. And, and the more you follow such a pattern, and the better and the clearer and the more precise you are with that, uh, the, the, the better it's going to be at the end of the day. Okay, so you need to write these things up. So when you now write a literature review, you can say this is what other people found, but a core ingredient in there are citations. Yeah. Citations. What is a citation? Well, citation, it's uh, not some kind of eye disease. Yeah. Uh, citation, citation, you have a uh, definition for it. Citation is referencing your sources within the text you're writing. Yeah. This is also known as in-text citation. And uh, referencing is acknowledging in detail all information, books, journals, articles, web pages, or whatever you used that you have used in completing your assignment or your writing. Yeah. And normally, you know, I have that now. Normally, you are uh, you have in-text citation and a full reference or bibliography at the end of your writing. Yeah. So in the within the text, and you say, I don't know, Grund 2016 says this. 
Yeah, and then you kind of summarize what I said, yeah, or somebody else said, or what they what they wrote in their paper. And by doing so, you make it clear that if you say this is what somebody found, that then the reader can actually look at the original source and read that up. Yeah? At the same time, you also make clear that you don't steal an idea here. Yeah, this is the idea of somebody else, or this is the finding of somebody else. And if I want to know more about how they did it, and all the problems with it, I can then jump back into and read the original article that you're citing. You don't have to summarize the whole article. You can just say they found differences in, uh, in health according to people, people's social networks, for example. Yeah. This would be now, you don't have to then show exactly how it is or use the data or whatnot, but you can cite. So it makes your life much easier as well. So in, generally, in general, there are two kinds of citations. Uh, one we call a direct quote, and the other one is paraphrasing. A direct quote is uh, whenever you use more than three consecutive words from another text, yeah, you basically put it in quotation marks. And then, where did you get it from? Yeah. And paraphrasing, paraphrasing, uh, paraphrasing that's um, when you uh, have an idea or a findings on intellectual property of somebody else and you reformulate it in your own words. So you're not using exactly the same words as the original source, like, I don't know, like a, like a line, like a text from that particular source, but nevertheless, it's the idea or the finding that somebody else has. So again, you kind of put a citation in it at the end of the day. So here I have now two examples. Um, as an example, okay, now I'm going back to, I'm using, using using ELSA, you know, that was this thing about the hypothetical deductible model that we had, Broadway shows and so on. And now you see here a direct quote. A direct quote would be, you know, this could be now a sentence within a writing that I have, or within an assignment that you do, or within a, I don't know, within an exam uh, paper that you write. One factor to explain more standing ovations in Broadway shows is that people, and now quote, admit to themselves that the show was poor or mediocre. Finish quote. And then, you see, now I have ELSA 2007, page 17. So with that, I can then go back and actually look at the original text. Actually, what, you, what that would be at the end of the day as well, that would also be like this bibliography at the very end of the paper, and there, there would be a line that says ELSA 2007, and then there's the detailed, the detailed uh, source of that. Yeah. Explaining social behavior, nuts and bolts, published by Cambridge University Press, blah, 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 and so on. So we, we, we cite with the name of the author, or if there are multiple authors, you know, we, we, we list those multiple authors, uh, and then the year, and then the page number. It's basically like an address. Yeah? With that, you can, you can pinpoint down the original source. Now in context, uh, paraphrasing. Yeah? So now I'm using the same, same idea that is there, you know, that people, I don't know, cannot admit to themselves that the show was poor or mediocre, but now I'm using my own words. Yeah? I'm saying one possible explanation of why there are more standing ovations in Broadway shows could be the increase in ticket prices. Again, it's on that page somewhere. Yeah. But you see now I'm not using a direct quote, but nevertheless I'm using this suggestion that Elster made. Yeah. Okay, so these are sort of the two kinds of citations. When you write a paper, you, you really need to uh, do that. And, um, why do we do that? Well, as I already mentioned, you know, it allows the reader to find further information about the sources that you have used. You know, so then the reader can actually jump back in. And you know, when, when you do a literature review, this is actually what you're doing too. Yeah? You, you read through, remember what I said about, I don't know, finding uh, maybe a core paper or something that is really relevant for your research topic, and then really looking at the big bibliography, uh, looking at who do they cite. Yeah? And then you trace down those other articles or other books, yeah, a bit like this spider search. Yeah. So you're doing exactly the same thing. This is what I'm doing too. Yeah. I don't know, I can't possibly know everything. And, uh, and nobody can. You know, there's so much stuff out there. But what we can do, we can be systematic in finding that stuff. And that's sort of why it's so important that when we produce something, that we follow these rules too. Yeah, that we cite correctly, that other people then can follow down this route through this spider web find us in there and kind of search out from there. Yeah. So that's one, uh, that's one important thing why we do that. But at the same time, you know, we need to acknowledge thoughts, ideas, and quotations from other people. Yeah. 
That's very important. You know, if you if you really want to if you want to uh, mess up your academic career, you don't cite correctly, yeah, and you you steal ideas from others and you claim it as yours. Basically, dead. Yeah? This is like a no-no. This is not what we are doing. Yeah? So you need to be very clear when you when you when you when you take thoughts and ideas from other people. Yeah? So give credit where credit is due, and uh, connect. The lastly, you know, as I already mentioned, it connects your research with the existing literature out there. So when I kind of cite some work, you know, then other people actually that wrote that work actually they see that I'm citing them. So, uh, or, I don't know, I write stuff and I can set up, I don't know, Google Alerts or whatnot. There are different tools for that. Then I kind of see who's citing my work. Yeah, and then I can connect with that community out there and engage with them. Okay, so now here I have some examples. This is now from a paper that I wrote uh, uh, through, now three years ago. Yeah. It's a funny paper. Uh, you could actually look it up, you know, now you have the source at the bottom. Yeah. That's sort of how it would end up in the bibliography at the end of the day, grund.t, yeah, and then the year, and then the name of the article. In this case, the article is called Why Your Friends Are More Important and Special Than You Think. Actually, in a follow-up research, I'm showing that your friends are not only more important than you, but they tend to be better looking and tend to be uh, healthier as well. Yeah. It's pure logic, if you're intrigued by that. Well, stay up to date about my publications. Um, or in the second year lecture, I talk about that. In analytical sociology, I have a lecture talking about that. Uh, but now, for now, we want to. We are concerned about the reference here. Yeah? So you see the name of the article, and then in italics, we have that's the journal title. Yeah? So now there's actually a, a sociology journal. It's called Sociological Science. The other journals, you remember last time, I had a few. There's the American Journal of Sociology, or the American Sociological Review. Or there's a European sociological re review, or one journal called Social Forces. You know, there's, there are lots of lots of journals out there uh, that have different, sometimes uh, a different uh, um, uh, different aspects that they look at, different focus that they have. But this is now the journal, yeah. and then you see uh, a comma, and then there's some further information to specify that. In this case, it says volume one. Sometimes there's volume or issue number. And then after that, there are some page numbers. So in this case, page number 128 to 140. And so with that, you could now pinpoint down this piece of writing that I did. So with that piece of information, you can now go into, let's say, in UCD Connect, you know, or in, in, in the library, OneSearch. I don't know, probably even if you just Google it, you find it. Yeah. OK, now this is sort of the, the first paragraph of that writing that I have. Yeah? So the article, there's a title of it, and then kind of the first writing, uh, the first paragraph starts like this. A large number of studies find associations between the positions of individuals and social networks, uh, and the attributes such as uh, tendency to innovate, and then Tsai, 2001, job search, uh, job search success, Granovetter, 1973, performance, Brazil, 2004, or even good looks, Malford et al., 1998, and Tom et al., 2008. Yeah. So what am I doing here? Um, I'm referring to other pieces of work that showed that. Yeah. So now I don't have to do the whole thing. Now I don't, have to, I don't have to convince you that there is a connection between ultimately the friends that you have and your chances of getting a job. But that's something that Granovetta, Mark Granovetta, already found. Yeah. He actually wrote a famous book about that. It's called Getting a Job. Yeah. And uh, that's the work that I'm citing here. So I'm referring to that. So I can build on that. So I'm building on the shoulders of Granovetter. I don't have to, uh, so I can take that as a given. Yeah, I can take that as a given and move on. Other people already showed that, that it's important, and that networks matter, or I don't know, uh, associations between positions of individuals and social networks. That's basically like, where are you within that network? Yeah, are, you, are you in the middle of it? Are you at the outside of it? Yeah. People showed that the position of people in, people in networks matters for certain kinds of outcomes. And Granovetter showed that for finding a job, Brass et al. found that for performance in general, and Malford et al. and some other, this other guy, Tong et al., uh, they, they showed that, it, that, it, uh, that there's an association between the position people have in the network and their good looks. So I'm building on, I'm building on that work. So these are sort of like in-text uh, in citations. So I'm referring to, to their work. 
And uh, this is sort of how it looks like at the end of this journal article, if you would scroll to the very end. You know, when I read a journal article, I equally read the, the bibliography. And for me, this is as important as the rest of the paper to see what are the other things that people wrote about, you know, and who are the people that wrote something about that, and where got it published. So, you know, see here I, for example, have the reference Brass et al. 2004. And here, as I have like uh, in detail, uh, Brass et al. stands for Brass Daniel, Joseph Galaskiewicz, uh, Henry Grieve, and Wen Pin Tsai, 2004. And now there's a different style here. Now it's in quotation mark, the, the, the title of this article taking stock of networks and organizations, a multi-level pers uh, perspective. And then after that, the journal in italics, now you see a number, now this stands for volume and issue, and then page numbers, and then I even have a web address. So this is like really pinning, pinning things down. Okay, so that's citation. And when you cite stuff, uh, when you write a bibliography at the end of the day, there are sort of different, different, uh, um, different ways how you can write uh, this, this bibliography at the end of the day. You know, we, call that, we call that a citation style. You know, a citation style. And one style would be like this, you know, that you have the name of the, of the people that are involved, and then quotation marks, and then the name of the article, and then in italics, the journal, uh, and then volume, issue. But that's a style. You know? So there's sort of other styles sometimes. You know? and you know, there are a few famous ones, so um, you come across that and actually it's part of the assignment as well, uh, looking at the Harvard citation style, so that's mostly used in sociology, or the APA style, which stands for the American Psychological Association. It's widely used also outside of psychology, and so we use it, so most of the time, in sociology journal, it's either Harvard or APA. And there are a few other ones. So when you read a science journal, uh, you see they, they cite differently. They have like, I don't know, little numbers in brackets inside the text and then you actually look up that number at the end, the bibliography, one, two, something like that. And then there's a description of uh, where this publication came from. Yeah, but that's sort of like different citation styles. And you have an assignment about that, yeah, to, to look up some research or some, some existing work and then write a bibliography using the Harvard citation style. So essentially it's really, you just need to look at this Harvard style. How, how do you do it? Do I first have the name and then comma and then the, the first name and then parentheses here or not? And it's really just the, uh, the, the, the standard for presenting stuff. Okay, so much about citation. So let me move on and quickly talk about plagiarism in that context. Plagiarism is basically when you don't cite correctly. That's what it is. Yeah? Plagiarism is the act of stealing someone else, or boss, it's, uh, it's the act of stealing someone else's written work and attempting to pass it off as your own. Yeah? It's just a big no-no. Um, not citing and referencing correctly counts already as plagiarism. Yeah? So you need, to, you need to be very clear in using your sources. And your know, plagiarism by itself, I don't know, you're all adults, you know, what's the point of, of, of being here if you kind of go ahead and copy the stuff of others? You don't learn anything. Yeah? I don't know, at the end, do I really care about, well, I do care, but, but I don't know, ultimately it's not about the grade that you get for this course. For me, the most important thing is that you actually learn something, and then you get something out of this, you're paying lots of money for this, so plagiarism, you're really shooting yourself in your own foot, if that's something that you do. So I think generally in life, it doesn't really pay, but at the same time, my experience is people, people notice. Yeah. So maybe you can fake it once or twice, but after that, you're going to get exposed and then it's not going to fly very well. So in the academic business, don't do plagiarism. There are, uh, it's a plagiarism policy at UCD, uh, which, uh, which uh, outlines in great, great detail what plagiarism is or what it is for us here at UCD. You know, presenting work authored by a third party, including other students, friends, family, or work purchased through internet sources. So if you kind of pass it off as your own, or if you present work copied extensively with only minor textual changes from the internet, yeah. let's face it. I don't know. Most of the time, lecturers notice these kind of things anyway. You know, suddenly, you're writing somehow differently in a way, but uh, it's not really helpful anyway. But also, if you if you if you if you paraphrase not in the correct way, if you don't if you if you don't acknowledge your original source, uh, it already counts as plagiarism as well. Or if you um, if you uh, say that you did something by yourself, while in fact you had other people working with you on it. 
Yeah? That's very interesting too. Okay, just don't do it. It's just not good. It's just not good for yourself. Yeah. Okay, so much about catching up with literature, yeah, with uh, citation and plagiarism. Uh, I have one other topic that I want to catch up on a little bit, and that's um, research design. Yeah. So now I'm going to attempt a similar thing like I did before. I'm going to give you the big picture so that you actually see where we are with this, and maybe that helps you to, to, to then learn the material in, in a better way, but at the end of the day, you need to know it anyway, but maybe it helps to organize your thoughts. Okay, so research design, big picture. Again, let's jump back into the research process. Yeah. So a research process, you know, we had these four different phases, exploration, talked about that. Now we're actually jumping already into the second part here, which is planning your research. And we had this one before. And, uh, and there, you can then find design, operationalization, method, sampling. And actually, that's the kind of stuff that will keep us busy, busy I think, for the next three weeks or so. So we'll spend more time on each one of these. But now let's talk a little bit about research design. OK, in the lecture we had that research design sometimes means different things for different people. Uh, I think the distinction made in Breiman is a very useful one. And he presented these five different types of research designs experimental, cross-sectional, longitudinal, case study, and comparative. And I'm going to uh, talk about uh, each one of them now in a little more detail. So all of these research designs are essentially strategies for finding stuff out about whoever or whatever you are studying. Yeah? You want to shed some light on this. You want to know a little more about um, why are there so many uh, standing ovations now, yeah? or why does there seem to be a connection between um, social networks and health inequalities, yeah? or why, you know, remember I have this example, why do children that watch a lot of TV are the most violent ones. Yeah? So that's the example that we had, and now I'm going to use this example to talk you through those five different research designs according to Brian. Okay, experimental. So this is what I have already studied, so let me be quick about that. Experimental research design is essentially giving some people a blue pill and some people a red pill. And you see, this is now a very general design, and you might have thought that, hang on, this is sort of what the sciences do, yeah? in the social sciences we don't do that. No, that's actually wrong. Yeah? This is a very general design that we can equally do equally well in the social sciences. And some of the best sociological work that I've seen uses experiments. And experiments have this nice feature that they are really, really clear. Yeah. Because the only difference, there's basically a manipulation. You're not looking, you're not trying to, uh, uh, you don't have to worry too much about all those other things that could potentially matter. You know, like omitted variables, spurious relationships. All this kind of stuff when you just go out and you collect some data and there you are. But with, a, with an experiment, you basically have what we call a treatment or manipulation. Yeah. So ultimately, it's very simple. Yeah? You split your, your, your population or your study group uh, into two parts. One of them is the control group. And the other one is the treatment group. <coughs> then you test both groups on whatever you're interested in. Let's say you look at um, how many hours do children watch TV. You haven't done anything to these two groups yet, so actually these numbers should be more or less the same, yeah? because there's no difference in that yet. If, you, if you've done this random assignment, maybe there is some, I don't know, some random fluctuation or so on, but you kind of have a baseline for both of these groups, and in theory, this baseline should be exactly the same. Yeah? That's what we, what we mean as pre-testing both groups. And then you have the treatment. Yeah? Then basically you do something with the, with, with the one group, but you don't do it with the other one. And then you go back and you test both of these groups again, and then you measure again how violent are children, I don't know, how many hours TV did they watch, and so on. And then you, you, you know that you did something different to this one group, but you didn't do it to the other group. So if you then observe a difference, compare to how this difference was before, yeah. so basically you would calculate the group difference in the first instance, and then the group difference in the second instance, and then if, if there's a difference between the second instance and the first instance, it must be due to this manipulation that you've yeah? It must be due to the manipulation. 
And uh, that's sort of why experiments, you know, we also talk about them as the gold standard, yeah? because it really must be due to this manipulation. There's a lot of other things that happen, a lot of other things that go on, we call that unobserved heterogeneity. It's basically all stuff that still matters, but you don't have the data on it. But the beauty about this design here is that it doesn't matter that you don't have the data on it. Why? Because all this stuff that you don't know about, it should matter equally for both your control group and for your treatment group. So the only difference that you have between those two groups at the end of the day is one thing that you can control. One thing that you manipulated. That's sort of why, uh, why experiments are, are very, very uh, useful. Yeah? But not everything can be done in an experiment. Yeah? So how do you do an experiment? In the sciences, it's much easier. You just try something out. You know, right? But in social sciences, you know, how does an experiment in the social sciences look like? Yeah? Well, now here I have the example of the children. So one, uh, one possibility of using, you know, studying this phenomena that we had, children who, who, uh, who watch lots of TV seem to be more violent. Now we want to know about, okay, how does this, this relationship come about? Yeah. Is it that watching TV causes violence? Or is it that violent people tend to watch more TV to begin with? Yeah. Uh, now a possible experimental design would be you split up your kids yeah. into different groups. One group you're forced to watch a lot of TV, while the other group you don't. Right. And then, at the end of the day, if it is that watching TV causes violence, then the, the group that you force to watch to be should be more violent at the end of the day, compared to the group that you didn't force to watch to be, yeah, and you measure their violence. Yeah. So that's sort of how an experiment would look like in the social sciences. And people do amazing experiments, you know, like uh, you can do experiments about social influence, how people are influenced by other people. Yeah, and then you tell them different kinds of information. So for example, I have this one PhD student. Well, let's see, I hope that she's still coming because we, we didn't get funding for it. But the research question is, why so few people pay water charges in Ireland? I think it's an important question. And um, the idea to study here is that it matters. Well, first of all, we already know, we already know that um, the information that you get about others, how many other people pay water charges, matters for whether you're going to pay the water charges. Now, I was a bloody foreigner, I just came in here. I'm German after all. You know, I have to pay water charges, I pay them. But then I hear nobody's paying them. I read about it in the news. And then I wonder, why am I paying? This doesn't make sense. So you see, this is sort of like social influence that matters. But now we have this idea, we have this hypothesis that actually it matters from whom you hear this. There's good reasons to believe that, it, that if your friends don't pay the water charges, you're even more likely to not pay the water charges than when I tell you that a certain amount of the population doesn't pay water charges. So now, actually we're going to approach this with an experimental design. Now we're going to expose people to different situations where we tell them X amount of your friends don't pay water charges, are you going to pay water charges? Or X amount of the total population pay water charges, are you going to pay water charges? And then we kind of see if there are differences in that, it must be due to the type of relationship, to having an anonymous stranger or having a friend who is the person who doesn't pay the water charges. But we'll come back to that. I have actually one or two lectures on experiments, so I don't want to talk too much about this now. So the second is what we call longitudinal design. What is a longitudinal design? Well, a longitudinal design is basically bringing in time. And time, time can be your biggest ally when you want to know about causality. Yeah. So, a longitudinal design, you might wonder why are we doing this, but actually it asks the same questions again and again, at different points in time, with the same people, actually. So you go back to the same people and you ask them exactly the same question again. And then you have information about that individual over time. And then you actually see what was first. Was it first that people watched TV and then became they more violence, violent, or was it that they were more violent to begin with and then at the next time they kind of watched more TV? So it's like temporal sequencing can really help you to get towards causality because, I don't know, when you want to have causality, your cause needs to be before the effect. 
at least when you're not a quantum theorist, you know, because for those guys it's kind of messed up again. But in our world, whatever causes something needs to be there before the effect. And that's what you're capturing with the longitudinal design. You basically try to measure things before and after or even over longer periods of time. And then you can, uh, you can say something about uh, what's, what mattered first. At the same time, there's this other thing. You know, again, this is this unobserved heterogeneity. You know, saying that lots of other things matter. Why some people behave in a certain way. For example, some children just watch lots of TV. It has nothing to do with being violent, or others you know, just don't like it for whatever reason. Yeah? So it has nothing to do with what we are looking at. There's heterogeneity in our population. But now the idea here is, if you have measurements over time, when, when, when somebody just likes to watch lots of TV, they should like to watch, to watch lots of TV at all of those time points. Yeah? So again, when you kind of look at the, you basically you can look at within subject differences. You can look at, does somebody watch even more TV than they usually watch? Yeah. And all those other things that could explain why that person watched a lot of TV to begin with, doesn't really matter. Yeah? It's not like the baseline, but you can sort of factor that in, because it should matter the same for all time observations of that particular individual. That's sort of where longitudinal designs become very, very powerful. And then you can do panel analysis, and you can basically uh, can, can factor in all those stuff that you don't observe, but it should matter for all points in time. So I did uh, an example, you know, I did this study um, in my PhD, I looked at uh, passing networks in English Premier League football teams, uh, who passes the ball to home, but map that as a social network and so on. And then I wanted to know whether certain ways of organizing team play are better for performance at the end of the day. Yeah? Do you need to play in a centralized way with the superstar in the middle, or should you play in a decentralized way and so on. Now you could say there are all those other things why some teams are good and other teams are bad. Yeah, of course, I don't know. Some teams are great, you know, Chelsea is just great, they just have lots of money, yeah, while other teams, they just suck. Yeah. So there's not necessarily things about how they interact with each other, but maybe they just have worse players to begin with. Yeah. With the longitudinal design, you can actually factor these things in, because then if a team sucks, yeah. it should suck every time. Yeah. So then I can actually look at, do they suck less when they kind of play in a different way? So you see, I have the baseline of how good a certain team is, like unobserved energy, things that I don't really know about that team, but I kind of can make the assumption, or it makes reasonable reason to assume, that it should matter for all of the observations of that group. And then I look at the difference between how do they differ compared to how they normally are. And then I can relate that with how their passing network looks like, or more precisely, do they play in a centralized or in a decentralized way. So it's basically bringing in time that is very, very powerful. So, uh, you know, the example of our children, uh, basically you would collect data about children at different points in time, T1, T2, and so on, and uh, you would collect data about uh, how much TV do they watch and how violent they are at these different points of time. You would look at the difference between those two groups before at time one and at time two, and then you compare these two differences with, uh, with each other. Yeah? So that's basically what we had before, kind of trying using time to unpack, to unpack that relationship. And then we kind of see if, it's, if it is that, I don't know, TV makes children more violent, we should see that kind of an increase in watching TV at time zero leads to a change in T1. You know? This is sort of the cause and the other one is the effect. Why they should, why we wouldn't expect like, I don't know, higher violent, uh, violence in T0 leading to T1 if there's no causal relationship yeah, on, on watching more TV. While if it is the other way around, you would observe uh, this solid relationship here, yeah, that violence comes first and then watching TV comes afterwards. So time can be very powerful and you know when experiments are the gold standard, uh, longitudinal designs are the silver standard, and uh, now let's move on to cross-sectional designs. So cross-sectional designs is basically, you know, now we're getting a little more, uh, more accurate. Uh, it's basically collecting data at one point in time. And maybe this is what you've thought about so far. You know, that this is sort of how research is being done. I go out, I run a survey, I get data about that. It's absolutely fine, but you already see, and especially thinking about uh, uh, the lectures we had on causality, how do you know what is causing what? What is sort of, 
coming first and what is coming, coming second. So that's sort of why cross-sectional designs are of lesser quality than experiments and longitudinal designs. But you're looking at within, within population variations. So you look at do some people, I don't know, are some people more violent than others, and then you ask them, do they watch more TV than others? But you can't really get to the, to the causal relationship. You know? So a design would be, uh, for our children, you conduct a survey and ask parents about their children, and you look at the level of violence and the amount of TV children watch, and then you compare children who watch lots of TV with children who watch less TV. Yeah. So that's sort of like less good standard. We have uh, case studies. Case studies, just very briefly, uh, case studies is basically an intensive analysis of a single case or a setting. Uh, so you really dive in, you go into depth. Uh, some of my colleagues do that, so if you're interested in that, there are more lectures on that in the second and in the third year. And a comparative approach is basically you take two of those cases and you look at, okay, what are the differences? But again, it's sort of like finding a small set as a representation for a larger group of, uh, of, uh, of individuals or, or units that you look at. No? But, it's, but it's different from, from uh, it's obviously you can't say much about generalizability or, or, or representation in this case. Okay, so uh, keep in mind on Wednesday, bring your mobile, tablet, or computer or whatnot, and we have. Okay, thanks.